in my early years, I was fascinated by airplanes. I couldn't understand how they could not fall right from the sky. I, I was trying to figure out what's going on. My technical mind was always trying to figure out things. The first time that I saw a, a model plane flying was, I was about 11. I couldn't believe, how can a toy fly? I mean, I thought only the big planes fly. So, I mean, it was a discovery, the discovery of the century for me. <laughs> I can build that thing. In fact, I went home and I decided that uh, I was going to build one. The guy that was flying the model plane said, uh, look, you know, uh, there is a place where you can buy a book. That's why I bought the book, and uh, it was the first book that I ever bought with my own money. And the third model that I built, after reading the book, actually flew. So I learned how to build modern planes on my own, and that experience has been really foundational for me, for the simple reason that I did not buy the kits, and then you, you follow the instruction, you assemble the pieces. No, <laughs> I had to think the model, what I want, figuring out you know, what it's going, it's going to look like, and you know, then make a plan, a one-to-one -one scale plan. And uh, so with that, I was able to, uh, you know, to, to then build something that you know, would give me the satisfaction of accomplishing the entire process, which is exactly what you do with a product. So by the time I was 12, I knew how to you know, be an engineer. <laughs> I was born in 1941, in December, and it was, uh, you know, the war was raging at that time in, in Europe. My family was not worried yet, but in 1943, when the Allied forces landed in Sicily and were moving north, my hometown was near Venice, so it was all the way north, close to Austria, and so they decided to move into their village where they were born. So. That's where I ended up in that in the village. I grew up in the agricultural age where basically in the countryside, we had electricity, but in the countryside, they did not have electricity. They were still using plows driven by horses or in those cases, you know, by oxen. There was no running water in the homes, you know, in the, in the, in the farms. Basically like uh, people lived 200 years earlier. And then when I went back to, uh, to Vicenza, my, my, where I was born, the Industrial Revolution was in full swing. Okay, so, you know, workers were, you know, going to work with their bicycle, you know, it's seven o'clock in the morning or 6.30 in the morning. And so it was that hustle bustle that, uh, that you know, we still had. Then the computer changed the entire thing. Now we are in the post-Industrial Revolution. Now it's basically informational revolution. And I was part of that of that revolution, and so, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's an interesting life. I feel fortunate to have been able to experience all, all those ages because I never disconnected from the agricultural era in some ways. You know, you, you live with nature. In that environment, I grew up frankly, loving machines because I couldn't understand machines. So my first job when I was 18 was at Olivetti in Milan. And uh, there they used transistors. In fact, uh, they had just announced in 1959 the first computer using transistors. About the same time that IBM announced the first computer using transistors because before the computers were done with vacuum tubes. And so I learned transistors, and there I developed a new, you know, a small experimental computer, and I built it. I entered the scene there in 67, when I, after graduating from university, I worked for SGS Virtual. I developed their first MOS technology and two integrated circuits at Virtual. I developed a new technology that allowed to build integrated circuits that were five times faster. You could put twice as many transistors in the same area, same cost. The leakage current was between 100 and 1,000 times less. 
And so now with this new technology, we could for the first time build semiconductor memories, microprocessors, and all the other pieces of a computer so that a computer could be put in a single chip. Silicon gate technology, and my silicon gate technology became the technology to make all the integrated circuits. When I started, 95% of all integrated circuits were bipolar. 20 years later, 15 years later, 95% of all integrated circuits were MOS with silicon gate. So that technology completely changed the way we do things. The decision to come to the States it was not a decision because I was supposed to stay here six months and then go back. It was an exchange of engineers. We had just married my wife, Alvia, uh, in, in September, and they wanted me to go for six months in Silicon Valley. So yeah, the decision to stay was while I was working here. My first project was so, so important that I did not want to go back. So when I joined Virtual in uh, February 1968, MOS technology was uh, was still having having lots of problems. You know, it was certainly a promising technology, but it was not ready for prime time. By April, I had already the first transistor with silicon gate with the process fully developed to make the entire transistors as part of an integrated circuit. Then I designed the first chip using this technology, and then. In early July, uh, it worked. And it worked and it was very clear that it was so much superior to the, to the previous one. And by the end of 68, uh, the first uh, 37 OE were sold commercially. They were five times faster. Leakage was from 100 to 1,000 times lower. So with that, I had the technology that allowed to build all the parts of a computer in the same technology. So that eventually when we could make larger devices or smaller transistors, the entire computer could be in a chip. So I decided to go to Intel and Intel had a project for me and it was the design of a microprocessor. My wife, Elvia, helped a lot. She really uh, came to my, to my help because he was very busy. He was going to test uh, the latest batch of microprocessor. And, uh, you know, I was really waiting anxiously uh, for him to come back and tell me. And then I remember I had to go to bed, lie down, and as I was almost falling asleep, I uh, heard him coming in and I immediately got up <laughs> from bed and went uh, to, to him and he said, it works, it works. And we were elated, elated this world, totally. The microprocessor was a really a, a major step forward because uh, it allows to build a computer in very small footprint, you know, with much less power dissipation, much less cost, and so on. But it was the first time that you could see how, as you could make smaller transistor, faster transistor, and so on, you could continue to scale this. Zilog, my first company, developed the Z80 microprocessor, was the successor of the 8080, which was the first real microprocessor with sufficient power. It was six times faster became a bestseller, is still in production 49 years after being introduced. That technology changed the way we do systems and uh, immediately spawned personal computers. These personal computers were the first major applications where you know, the computer became democratized, you could have a computer, and that changed the world. My, my father, in a sort of a subtle way, has been very present in me, especially since I moved into more philosophical subjects like the study of consciousness, the study of free will, and those things, you know, a lot of the work that my father did 
uh, which I found out later, was related to this stuff in a very strong way. You know, interesting consciousness started uh, when I was studying neuroscience books, biology, and uh, I was asking myself if the signals in the brain, how can the electrical signals be the same as it tastes to the food, or the smell of a flower, or the love that I feel for a person? How can that be the same? Because consciousness is about the fact that we can actually know by feeling. And so I discovered the higher promenade of consciousness. The promenade of consciousness was also important to me personally because I was not happy with myself in my life. After having achieved everything that the world says that if you do, you should be happy, I was not happy. And, and I didn't know why. And so my promenade was a promenade of consciousness. We are not machines, we're not like computers. We are actually beings that for the first time we're beginning to understand who we really are. We are much more than even quantum computers. Our cells are quantum and classical, but work with principles that we have yet to discover. We are not our body. We are a field. This field does not even exist in space and time. Quantum fields don't exist in space and time. Our body is a drone, it's like a drone, it's like an instrument connected with the consciousness that does our, the bidding of consciousness. Consciousness has free will, in other words, can decide what to observe and how to act. And the purpose of one, the totality of what exists, is to know itself. So we are parts whole of one, but we are fields, the body, is simply a structure that is for some time used by the field in order to, ex to explore this reality where people like us interact and we have to find out who we are. It's pretty smart, I would say, and it's very dedicated and persistent. He won't quit until he gets it. My journey has been especially rewarding because I would have never imagined that after being an inventor, after having started companies and run companies for 40 years, uh, I would have been working on the inner plane, in the interiority, you know, bringing together the heart, the mind, and the belly, what I call ethical, courageous actions. So to me, this journey has been incredible. Being able to, in a way, explain to the people that had similar experiences what they could not explain themselves is really rewarding, much more rewarding than anything that I've ever done in my life. <laughs>